The way federally insured student loans work is quite simple. If the student comes from a middle income background, the money is lent by, say, a bank. And the federal government guarantees that the money will be paid back whether the student pays up or not. Well, we don't want to sue you if we don't have to. HEW says it costs about $200 to get back a thousand. Well, we knew of two lawyers who defaulted on their student loans. Is there a great sense of urgency about repaying a government loan? I would say no. Now, I gather the administration is asking for another billion to be put into the general area of student loans, correct? Student loans and grants. That's correct. Well, more than that. We're asking for about a billion and a half to be put into the area of student loans and grants. To be honest, what I like about it is the money I win. Joe Dweck and the other 255 championship players are competing for a first prize of $23,000. And that's just for openers. Joe Dweck, twice European champion, $3,500. The money raised at the auction is distinct from the prize money. It is more like pure gambling. If you're the high bidder for a player and that player wins the tournament, you, not the player, collect the winner's share of the auction pool. Few men are called a legend in their own time. Vladimir Horowitz is. A superb technician, a man of glowing warmth. He has also been tormented by self-doubt during his reign as the world's finest pianist. Tonight, a rare portrait of Vladimir Horowitz. I'm Mike Wallace. I'm Morley Safer. I'm Dan Rather. In a moment, those stories and more tonight on 60 Minutes. This portion of 60 Minutes is sponsored... Most everyone knows what backgammon is. It's a game played on those funny, elongated triangles on the back of a checkerboard. And until a few years ago, that's pretty much all most of us knew about it. Not so anymore. In the last few years, the popularity of the game has soared, and it has joined checkers, Monopoly, and Scrabble in the all-time bestseller list of board games. There are today an estimated 20 million Americans who play backgammon regularly. What's the allure of backgammon? Come with us to the island. Winter tourist season in full cry at Paradise Island in the Bahamas. But many of the tourists, at the Britannia Beach Hotel at least, aren't paying the least bit of attention. They are in training. Not for them the pool or the beach. Later this day, they will sit down to the serious business of competing in the annual World Championship of Backgammon. Some of the very best players in the world are playing here for the thrill of winning and also, as we shall see later, for the money. But there are also a lot of not so great players here and because backgammon is a game in which luck plays such an important part over the short run, they too have a chance of beating the best and winning the prize. Backgammon is an ancient game. In one form or another, it has been played for several thousand years. The Crusaders brought it back to Europe from the Middle East. Even then, it was a gambling game. Richard the Lionheart, in the year 1190, forbid anyone in his army below the rank of knight from playing it for money. It was played widely by the nobility of Europe throughout the Middle Ages. Even today, it is the most popular game in the Middle East, played with devotion in Tel Aviv, and in Cairo, and at 33,000 feet by Arab millionaire middleman Adnan Khashoggi. In the United States, it is played everywhere, in the CBS cafeteria, for example, in modest rooms like the Bar Point Club on New York's 14th Street, where the winner of the weekly tournament can win a few dollars. And it is played in elegant private clubs where the rich and famous gather to dance and drink and play. Clubs like Pips in Los Angeles. Some of the best play here. Louis de Jong, whose business these days is running big tournaments. Could you record my double one for posterity? Jean Noel Grinda, winner of the European Championship last July at Monte Carlo. Billy Eisenberg, a ranking American bridge player, now also a ranking backgammon player as well. It's forbidden to play for money here at Pips, of course, against the law. But it's hard to conceive that some money doesn't change hands somewhere after a night's play is done. Backgammon is big business in stores, too. At Chess and Games in Los Angeles, more than 10,000 sets are sold each year. Price range, $20 to more than $500. At New York's Gammon Shop, some handmade table models go for as high as $2,500. And they say business is excellent. It may not seem so, but the game is simple.
The board is laid out this way. Blacks counters or men move around the table in this manner. Yellows move in the opposite direction. The object of the game is to get all of your men all the way around the table and off of it before your opponent does. Now, under the rules of the game, no player may land a piece at a point at which the other player has two or more pieces. However, if by roll of the dice, you land at a point where your opponent has only one piece, then your opponent's piece has to go all the way back to the starting point and come back all the way around the table. The rules of the game are so simple that even a child can learn it in a matter of minutes. So what's the big attraction of this game? Well, it's because the pieces are moved around the board on the basis of the roll of dice. And dice can be very unpredictable. Now, of course, backgammon is not as simple as it looks. Advanced players use strategy and tactics based on their understanding of the laws of probability of dice. They know when the odds are with them for a run toward home and when it's best to lay back and try to ambush an opponent. But what makes backgammon so exciting, what makes it called the cruelest game, is that all of your best laid plans can be completely dashed with one single roll of the dice. The appeal of backgammon is the great mix of luck and skill. And um, I feel I have the skill. And um, I'm also a gambler, which means I enjoy the luck. I like, I, it gets the adrenaline going. Joe Dweck, former Egyptian, Harvard Business School graduate, former Wall Streeter, has been a professional gambler, mostly at backgammon, for the past seven years. Sitting next to him, by the way, is Nick Carl, one of the biggest casino and betting parlor operators in England. And you get this tremendous amount of people coming here. Some are good, some are bad, some are hopeless, but they all have a chance in backgammon. They wouldn't have the chance in bridge. They would have no chance in chess in a tournament like this, but you have the chance to person who's a poor player has a chance to win the tournament and that is the appeal and that's why this game is growing so much but i mean this respectfully but i've heard that uh, over a lot of games where someone's trying to suck you in they always say well even a unskilled player with luck can beat a highly skilled player now is that true or is that part of the hustle no it's it could be part of a hustle i mean um, it could easily be my line but it's true it's true in a tournament of this nature a big tournament a major world championship a poor player can win it. You mentioned what you like about it is the blend of skill and luck. Well, uh, to be honest, what I like about it is the money I win. But, uh, but I like the excitement, too. Joe Dweck and the other 255 championship players are competing for a first prize of $23,000. And that's just for openers. The players paid their own way to this tournament at Paradise Island and each put down $200 as an entry fee, $51,000 in all. An additional $20,000 in prize money, plus the cost of running the tournament, came from Resorts International, which owns the hotel and the casino next door. Players were not discouraged from trying their hand at craps or roulette. A co-sponsor was Philip Morris International, a premium brand cigarette sold in Europe. But the real money doesn't come from that either. It is raised in an auction held the night before. 3,000, Joe Dweck, twice European champion. 3,500, Mr. Monheim. Any advance on 3,500? 3,500 for Joe Dweck. The money raised at the auction is distinct from the prize money. It is more like pure gambling. If you're the high bidder for a player and that player wins the tournament, you, not the player, collect the winner's share of the auction pool. After the auction, players can buy back a portion of themselves but often they also try to buy other players to hedge, so to speak. They form syndicates, partnerships. Some have regular backers. It is the big money world of international backgammon. 4,000 over here, Kevin McClory. 4,000, that's dollars, not Irish pounds. $4,000 from the producer of the James Bond films. The total auction pool set a new record, twice as much as the tournament prize money. But I do think it's the biggest one we've ever had on this side of the Atlantic. It comes to $141,000 on the nose. What about hustling in backgammon? Can you hustle someone in backgammon? What about it? <laughs> Done regularly? Not by me anymore. <laughs> well, let's do a little consumer guide for backgammon. How does one uh, recognize a hustle? Uh, well, they come in all sizes, shapes, and varieties, rather like Heinz and the 57 soups. Uh, you see, I'd like to ask you a question, if I may. Sure. How do you define hustling? Let's define hustling as a very experienced 
player trying to bring in a less experienced player for the purposes of taking his money? Well, if you're talking about, in this instance, myself or other players of, if you like, of my reputation, players who are well known like Joe Dweck, Paul McGreal, Jean Noel Grenda, these are people who are capable of making a lot of money at backgammon. Um, to give you an analogy, do you think Arthur Ashe could walk in here and hustle the tennis? <laughs> I think people would very soon know who he is. Well, it's the same thing in backgammon. But there are, yes, I, I'm quite sure, and I've run across a lot of them, uh, young, mainly, uh, semi-unscrupulous uh, individuals who try and get an old lady, you know, when she's had one drink too many. But um, it exists, and I think it exists at bridge, poker, backgammon, golf. Oh, no, never at golf. <laughs> or any other game. It's part of human nature. What makes backgammon such a gambler's gambling game is this. It's called a doubling cue. Now, at any time during the game when you think you're ahead of your opponent, you can offer a demand to double the stakes on him. If he refuses, he loses. If he accepts, the game goes on. Then later, if fortunes turn, he can then offer to double the stakes on you. And if you refuse, you lose. There's no limit to the number of doubles in a game. Backgammon being a game of dice, the situation can change very rapidly, and so the cube can go back and forth. So if you're playing, assuming you're playing at a dollar a point, it can go from two dollars to four to eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, and with certain lunatics, it can even get higher. And that is what makes the game so terribly exciting. One indisputable fact we learned in our backgammon travels is that every backgammon player, expert or novice, thinks he's a better player than he is, and that goes for she too. If he wins a game, that's skill. A loss is blamed on unlucky dice. Not once in all the sad tales we heard in Nassau and elsewhere did anyone ever admit that his opponent was a better player. But one man who clearly is a better player, one of the best in the world, is Paul McGrill, author, backgammon columnist, and winner of this backgammon championship. His winnings, $23,000 for first place, plus $25,000 from a side bet he had made on himself, plus any share he might have had in the $50,000 his backers made from the auction money. Not a bad week's work. My impression as an outsider is that it's luck that makes the big difference. No, I'd say luck is very much overrated. I mean, of course, with the fascination of the game is it's a blend of luck and skill. But the luck part is so obvious and so omnipresent. You run the dice every time, and the skill part is a, is a lot more hidden. But the, the game is unbelievably deceptive. There is much, much, much more skill than there appear on the surface. And you're going to Saudi Arabia to try your skill and luck? To try my skill and luck and uh, just to teach. Tell me about that. Um, well, I've been invited by a uh, Saudi Arabian prince to go there for a few weeks and uh, teach him uh, the, some of the finer points of the game. How did you get into that job? Um, well, so I, I just happened to run into this uh, sheik at a uh, discotheque, Studio 54 in New York, and I had no idea who he was, and he had no idea who I was. And I played the guy one game, and he said, I want you to come to Saudi Arabia with me, work it out with my, you know, uh, lackey here or whatever. <laughs> so uh, that's where I'm going. I don't want to pry deeply into your <coughs> personal affairs, but could you give me some general idea of what deal you struck with his accountant? Um, well, he's giving me my first class plane fare and reservations, and he's uh, paying me a few thousand dollars plus whatever fringe benefits uh, may accrue. One of those fringe benefits might be some fairly high-stake games. Not unheard of, of course, for a millionaire to pay for the privilege of playing with the best. But tournament play, too, is getting bigger and bigger. Prize money in the major events around the world is rapidly approaching the big money sports of tennis and golf. In this tournament in Las Vegas a few weeks ago, the man in the light shirt won $180,000. And Joe, what's the most money you've ever played for? I've played for a lot of money. I don't want to actually specify what I've played for, but I have played for large I can understand why. You played for six figures? Um... Uh, when you say four six figures, has there be, ever been a six figure swing, you mean, yes. at the end of the session? Very close to that. And what were you thinking when it was that kind of money on the line? I was thinking, I hope I win. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, hold your life of mine over here. Let me do the last. 
The last thing I ever thought I'd be doing is rowing around inside the belly of an oil tanker.